So welcome to Messini, ancient Messini at least. And I bet most of you've never even heard of this place. To be really honest, until recently I hadn't either. It's the same scale as Epithavros or Corinth, uh, much larger than Mycenae, but it's hardly visited. You know, in comparison to those places which are incredibly popular, very few tourists come here. We're about three hours from Athens, down in the South Peloponnese, 16 kilometers from Kalamata. And it's astonishing, absolutely astonishing. I'm standing here in the stadium. We'll have a look at that later in the video, but there's so much here. It's just mind blowing. And I'm gonna take you around. Hopefully you'll enjoy it. And hopefully you will be convinced that you need to come here because it's astonishing. So the city of ancient Messini is actually quite impressive. It's huge, there's loads to see here, and I'd highly recommend if you're in Kalamata, which is only 16 kilometers away, and you have the chance, you either take a tour bus or you come up here in a hire car, because it's somewhere that if you're in the area, you really, really should visit. I mean, the start of the views, as you can see, are fantastic. But this is a very large site. I thought that the origins of this city go back to 1500 BC, the Mycenaean times, when there was a town or a village called Ithion here. And local legend has it that Ithion, and Ithion was a nymph, um, Ithion was where Zeus was born. Now, the city as we see it here was created on the old site of Ithion in 371 BC. And we can be very definite about that because the Spartans suffered their first and only major defeat of the Peloponnesian War, which basically finished their civilization, if I'm honest about it, in 371 BC. And Spartan society was obviously very brutal and was supported by a slave class below the Spartans called the Helots. And the Helots, shortly after this um, defeat for the Spartans, revolted. They obviously decided that they'd had enough. They wanted their freedom. And as an army, and I assume they were an army because I don't think you could be slaves in, or helots, they were very specific slaves, but slaves in Spartan society without being fairly militaristic yourself and knowing how to fight. The army of helots came up here to what had been Ithion and very, very quickly built a nine kilometer wall around this site to defend themselves against further attack from the Spartans. And we can see that wall um, running around this site. But they made, they built this wall in 85 days, which shows just how important this wall was, how organized they were, and how worried they were about the Spartans. And they were right to be, because shortly after they completed the wall, the Spartans came back down and attacked this place and tried to wipe the helots out, or at least put them back into servitude. But they failed to do so, partly because the helots, who were now Messenians, obviously living here in Messini, had allied with Philip of Macedonia and Philip sent his army down here and that was really the end of the Spartans if I'm honest with you. Um, Philip of Macedonia of course was the father of Alexander the Great so suddenly we went from a Spartan society to the helots of Sparta, the slave class of Sparta, creating essentially in, in a way a new Sparta but culturally it was very different because they didn't want to be slaves. So about 800 metres up the road from ancient Messina, you have to get in the car, we come across the walls, or part of the walls that surrounded ancient Messina. And this is why they came here. This is what they built. They built these walls. Okay, I'm sure they added to them. But, but they built these walls in 85 days from when they arrived here after the defeat of the Spartans. And this was known as the Arcadian Gate. This monolithic gate here was known as the Arcadian Gate because the road went north to Arcadia. But it gives you an idea of just how powerful and rich this place was when it existed all those years ago. And as I said, these walls were now on the outside, stretched for nine kilometers around this site, encircling it and protecting it from attack and allowing them sufficient land within the walls to survive siege. Monolithic Cyclopean architecture at its very, very best. Look at this. God, I love Greece just astonishing. It, every time you come and see something new in Greece, it takes your breath away. You think you've seen it all and then you see something completely awe-inspiring like this. I should say this construction that I've just been standing on while I've been explaining the history or the establishment of this city is known as the Fountain of Arisino. 
and it was effectively the water supply for the city. The water supply came down from the mountains and was gathered here. And there were fountains here. It must have been very impressive, but this was the water supply for this city. Now, the buildings in the middle here obviously weren't created in 85 days. I would imagine that having left Sparta, escaped Sparta, the Helots then put all their energies into defending their newfound freedom. They built the wall, as I said, in 85 days. And these buildings were built in the fourth and third, third centuries, really, following that. But there was a major, major town here. It was as big as Corinth, it was as big as Epithavros. It had a different function though, as I said, whereas Epithavros, for example, was a center of healing. Um, this was a town like any other. So you can see here, although reconstructed in part for modern day use, we have a fantastic Hellenic theater. Um, and this town has everything that you'd expect within a Greek Hellenic town. We have a theater, we have an agora, um, we have a temple, it's fantastic and we'll just have a quick look round at all these buildings so that you can get a flavour for this place. If you want to see Hellenic Greece in the summer without perhaps the huge numbers of crowds that you'll get at Epithavros, that you'll get in ancient Corinth, that you'll get in Mykines, this is an option that you should consider. And actually it's great because you can explore these buildings, you're allowed to walk into them, you're allowed to walk round them. Um, this wasn't an enormous theatre, I think it held six or seven thousand, which by Hellenic Greek standards made it actually relatively small. The larger theatres, for example, in Argos held 20,000. But you can hear the acoustics here. I mean, the acoustics are amazing. I'm not sure what's making those noises, whether it's birds or ducks or what, but there's something in here making noise and you can hear it being amplified. I think these noises are actually geckos, but you can, or toads, no they're toads, they're toads, because it rained really heavily here yesterday, and these toads here, look there's one here, I don't know if you saw him, are making this noise, but you can hear the amplification in this place, it's quite astonishing, I mean these are small toads making this noise obviously excited because it rained a lot yesterday and the noise is just incredible it shows just how amazing this place was i mean you can see the seating went all the way up the hill here but it's only been uncovered to this point look at this amazing see the wall up there marks the top of the theater just this theater was actually pretty large but only a little bit being uncovered nowadays and rebuilt essentially for modern performances. Right in front of the theatre, which is now behind me, we have this really interesting complex of buildings. It might not look interesting now. I mean, it's just a few foundations, although you can see it went down pretty deep. But this was a cult of Isis, which moved from Alexandria to Messini in the second century and was absolutely surrounded by a moat of water because it was meant to represent the Nile. And I don't know why it moved it. I'd have to do my research. It was probably something that happened in Alexandria and Egypt at the time, I don't know. But Isis was celebrated here and venerated here for a couple of hundred years. Um, in these buildings here, surrounded by water. And this water was hugely important. As I said, it represented the Nile and was important in the renovation or the worship of this God. And to the left of this huge ancient pagan temple, I suppose, which would have been hugely impressive with these moats and so on, we have an old, very early church. And this was a 7th century AD church. So this was 900 years after the temple we've just looked at. But it illustrates that the site here continues to be occupied through to the 7th, 8th, 9th and 10th centuries. This was a large basilica. It was an Orthodox church. Um, it was not contemporary with the Hellenic Greek, obviously, being a church. It was built after the birth of Christ. And as I said, 7th century. Um, the site here, having been established by the Helots, invited effectively people who had been exiled 
by the Spartans to return to their homeland and they did and they occupied this site with the Helots and so this site grew and it continued to prosper until about 365 when there was a huge earthquake in Crete which affected a lot of the southern Peloponnese as well both in terms of its physical standing but also its economic and from that point onwards this city started to decline and by the 10th century it was pretty well abandoned and the villages that we see around us one over there the one above us and so on took over so the people just moved out of the site which had been destroyed by a number of earthquakes and economic calamities if you like and was no longer fit for purpose and that's really what just became abandoned it became old it became ancient i suppose in a sense so many churches in greece this byzantine church of the seventh century was actually built on a temple site there was prior to this church a tholos here a round building a temple dedicated to aphrodite and you can see the foundation in a sense of the building just inside this mosaic and this mosaic ran around this temple to aphrodite this tholos and in my experiences round buildings generally deal with death but there's no evidence of that here but there was on this site before this byzantine church was built on top of it a large round temple with columns to aphrodite which is just amazing really i mean a it's vandalism obviously to destroy it but they didn't see themselves as destroying history they saw themselves as destroying a pagan religion that no longer was relevant to the Christians who lived here and the Christians who lived here therefore wanted to build something on top of it to show that they'd superseded I guess the religion that was here previously but then to the right here we have this amazing stella just fantastic and these columns would have run around the whole site here very large building and this stoa it sounds very fancy it was a meat market um literally this was where they bought the cattle and slaughtered them and sold them and people would come in here like you would in a modern day market to buy meat to buy food and it would have been a very vibrant smelly fly ridden place fantastic and amazing because of the architecture and the columns but still a meat market effectively and the history here, as with everything in Greece, we've got a 7th century church there from 700 AD, which in itself is early for a church, built on top of a temple to Aphrodite, which was 3rd century, by the way. And then this site as a whole, as I said, 371, they built the walls around it. That's when they came here. Now this stoa, or southern stoa as it's known, this meat market, which you can see here, and it would have sold other things such as cereals and liquids and so on, was not the only stoa here. There was also a northern stoa up here. And what we're in here, bordered really by these walls up here and down to where the group of tourists are down there, is the Agora or the town centre of Messini. Every Hellenic Greek town had an Agora, as did the Romans, but this was a Greek Agora. And it was huge. This is about 35,000 square meters. This is the site of a large superstore, um, very large superstore. And it would have been a bustling, bustling place. 30, 40,000 people here every day, buying, selling, trading, living, enjoying themselves. So this up here with the North Stoa and the Bem. And in the middle here, very obviously different, we have some Roman baths, but we'll look at them in a minute. Now, the North Stoa here did not function as a commercial building. It was more of an entertainment and a political building. So here, I believe, we have the Berma, and every Agora had a Berma, which was essentially where people would stand up and talk about things which were important to them in that day. So, for example, in Corinth, the Berma was visited by St. Paul the Apostle. Now that's one of the reasons why St. Corinth is so much more popular than Messini, because both are Bermas, but St. Paul did not come here. And let's face it, we're not an hour from Athens. We're about three, three and a half hours from Athens here. But we have a Berma, which was used for oration, for talking to the masses. People would have been collected here in front of the Berma, listening to people talk. And you have these niches here set into the side where the politicians of the day, the important high-ranking officials of the day, would have been to receive people and hear their grievances. So this place 
was effectively, in a sense, a promenade. It was where you would come to be seen in your finery, to talk to high-ranking and important people in your community, perhaps hear your grievances, and understand and hear the ideas of the day. It would have been astonishing. You see a big place. This is not a small town. This is, as I said, as big as Epithavros, as big as Corinth, much bigger actually than Mekines. This was a really important place in Greek Hellenic culture and history. And then right in the middle of this, and as usual, you can see it's been built around the columns, the Romans decided to build a bath. And you can see the evidence of the hypercourse here, these columns of um, roof tiles, I suppose, in a sense, which would elevate the floor above the ground and they would light fires and allow the heat to run under these floors. So effectively you had underfloor heating. But this was a bathhouse for the Romans, built right in the middle, and I suppose probably in a sense, um, intentionally, in the middle of the North Stoa, really saying to the Greeks at the time, look, your politics are no longer important. Our leisure time, our bath time is more important than your politics. That's why they built this here. This would have been incredibly impressive to any visitors or anyone who lived here. You had this, as I said, Northern Stoa, this political, um, non-commercial colonnade here all the way down. You had the theatre over there with the fountains in the middle. And then as you scroll round, you had the temple to Aphrodite. You had a temple of Messini here. And on the other side, you had more columns. So effectively, the whole Agora here would have been absolutely amazing to look at. It would have been surrounded by columns, like almost one huge building, and enclosing the Agora of 35,000 square metres. Just amazing. I, I mean, to visualise what was here at the time, it would have been astonishing. Anything to rival modern buildings. There were so many sites, Greek sites, that were then occupied by the Romans and into the 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th centuries, you see old Christian nomenclature mixed amongst the ruins as well. Um, and the timescales boggle, you know, I talk about 371 BC, I talk about 780, that's a thousand years before you even start. Imagine a thousand years of history in modern day. You know, you're talking about the Norman Conquest in the UK, you're talking about 700 years before America even existed. And here we talk about a thousand years as though it's, it's all the same period. It's not at all, of course. These places, of course, are very dry now, but the Hellenic Greeks were masters, as were the Romans, of water. And you can see here an old cistern, and there was water pouring off the mountain, and it had been ducted all over this site. When I walk around, I don't really point them out, but constantly on the ground, you see what would have been water ducts, stone troughs effectively running downhill to take the water all over this site. And it would have been a very wet, green, lush site with literally fountains because the water pressure coming off the mountains, as you've just seen, would have allowed that. But look at this Cyclopean architecture, these big blocks of stone here. Oh, amazing. And the length of this stone is just ast astonishing. And then you come to the far end of this stone with these amazing Doric columns and these walls. And this was built in the 3rd century BC. It's 186 metres long, this um, stoa, all the way down to the other end there, which is astonishing. This end actually did have some commercial purpose. These tables here were for, used for selling grain and liquids, perhaps almost, if you like, an ancient takeaway more than anything. Um, rather than necessarily selling to take home, selling for those who were here to hear the orators, to talk to the politicians and so on. Coming over from the church and the Temple of Aphrodite and the southern stoa here, we come across another temple, and I think this one's likely actually older than any of those. This is the temple to Messini. Now, Messini was an ancient Mycenaean god, effectively. She was the goddess of land, and she gave her name not only to ancient Mycenae, Mycenae itself, but the whole county, because the whole county is now known as Messenia, and Kalamata, for example, sits in the county of Messenia. Um, and this was the temple to her. You can see, again, similar pattern to most temples. You had an outer room which would hang around the entire temple, supporting the roof, and then an inner sanctum, effectively, where you would go to the temples, sacrifices, whatever it happened to be. But this building here is probably one of the older on the site because it was to that god, the god whom this town was sitting. Now, as we cross 
the Agora here. You would think that we've seen most of what this place has to offer with the temples, with the Byzantine church, with the northern stoa, but we come across this astonishing building here, and I don't know if I can do it justice on this for camera, but this is an Asclepios, and this was actually the cultural and religious heart of Messini. Um, it was surrounded by these columns all the way around. So imagine the columns running all the way around here with a roof, so you could walk around under cover. And then in the center, you have various religious buildings, which would have effectively defined this area completely. Um, this was not an area of healing, unlike Epithavros, where Asclepios, the god of healing, was worshipped and venerated to heal people. Here it was purely religious. There was no healing here as such. So in the centre of this Asclepios, unsurprisingly, we have a temple dedicated to Asclepio himself. And it would have been surrounded by four magnificent stoa. So on each side, effectively, of this courtyard that was created, you had columnated stoas. Just amazing. And you can see some of the columns that remain here along this site and it would have been thronging with people here. As well as being surrounded by four stoves, the Asclepian also housed this Odeon, effectively an indoor theatre. Absolutely astonishing. Um, and this is on the northeast corner of the stone. Over in the far distance under this roof we have a Roman ruin. And I would expect actually that this Odeon was probably Roman rather than Hellenic. But that may not be the case. I can, I'm not an expert here. I can't tell you exactly the timeline that things were created. But this stoa would have been breathtaking to walk into. You come in and see in the centre a temple to Asclepius. And it would have been thronging with people. You would have had markets all around in these stoas selling different things in different places. And there would have been oh, Greek life here beyond anything that really you would see outside Athens. It would have been astonishing. And the temple here, unsurprisingly, and you can see it down here, had columns all the way round, a room in the middle for venerating Asclepios himself, but it would have been magical to watch because they were piping water under pressure down here. And it was flowing in spouts from the walls. This was not a static place. This was a place of life. Now, having seen two theatres, six stoas, four temples, and a huge Greek, Hellenic Greek glory, you would think that is it. That's Messini, but we've hardly started. This place just keeps going and giving. And down here at the bottom, we have a Hellenic stadium. Just amazing. I mean, I, I just, it takes my breath away what is here. You know, I've done Epithavros, I've done Corinth. This place is just enormous and virtually undiscovered. If you have a chance, please, please, please. On our please way down to the stadium and the gymnasium, we have the Hierothesium, which was a very complex religious and political building, basically used, as I understand it, to present Greek culture to visiting dignitaries. So there were 12 statues of the 12 Olympian gods here. And they would effectively receive visiting dignitaries here, allow them to stay here in safety and present to them the culture of Greece and Messini in this place. You see some sights in Greece, but this one just takes my breath away. The stadium here and the gymnasium on the right, surrounded by columns. I mean, you could be in a country house in the UK built in the 17th century. And that's the point. This is where that inspiration comes from. But just look at this place. This is not some country house in the UK. This is not some fake representation of Greek or Roman architecture. This is Greek architecture from 300 BC. This is just astonishing, and beautiful and amazing. And if you can come here, God's sake, come so here. coming down here into the stadium, you get an idea of not only what the stadium would have like, been like, but with these stoas, which would have been lined with columns, as I mentioned previously. And the views here are just astonishing. We have the gymnasium over here. 
and then we have this astonishing stadium. Now the Romans, I believe, and I might be wrong, but I think they repurposed this as a gladiatorial arena. Hence, you have the stone steps around and this wall at the end. But in Hellenic times, I don't think these stones would have been here. And you would obviously not have had those walls in the middle. And you would have had races here, running races, naked running races, where the men, the athletes, triumphed and were then venerated in the northern stoa by the political elite of the city. And the gymnasium here would have been a place for the athletes to rest, to prepare for their matches, to, to live actually during. Um, and it's just astonishing that this has survived in, in the way that it has. And you can see the city of Messini ranged up on the hill behind us. For those of you wondering what this chimney-like structure is here, this is actually a tomb, a grave of a prominent Messinian family, eight members, from about the first century AD. They clearly were prominent to build it here. Look at this though. I just can't get over how amazing this place is. And I'll be honest, I live in Greece. I never really thought about coming here until recently. I bet you haven't, but you should. As I said, the athletes used to live here and prepare for the games. And you have all the modern essentials, including, dare I say it, some toilets. Let's face it, every stadium needs toilets. So you've heard of Greek wrestling, I'm sure, particularly if you live in America. Well, this is the place where they wrestled. This is the stadium for wrestling. And right next door to it, we have places like the changing rooms, restrooms, and we have the baths. So once they'd wrestled, they came and bathed. Or maybe they bathed before they wrestled. Who knows? Just oh, nice. used for wrestling. This was also used as a training ground for weapon training and, I suppose, in a sense, martial arts. Um, obviously, they weren't games to all the time, and they still use these facilities, as you would any training camp, I guess. So finally, at the end of the stadium, we come in amongst this Doric columned building, which is just built on this enormous platform beneath us, as is the stadium here. And this was a mausoleum for prominent Roman families who lived here in the first to the third centuries AD. So in Hellenic times, this would not have been here. This was created by the Romans at the end of the stadium to allow them to bury their prominent dead. But it does set it off beautifully here. And as we look back towards Messini, you can see it would have been visible from most of the buildings up here. So this museum of Messini is actually about four kilometres from the ancient site itself and it's a little bit tricky to find but it's worth it because there have been excavations in Messini since about 1829 following the Greek War of Independence and the finds which they had were displayed here and as with all museums it's, it's breathtaking, it's very small but what they have here is fantastic and it shows a The excavations at this site are still ongoing um, and it's a very, very large giant site. Despite the fact it was highly defensive, you can see that in Hellenic Greece, the style was consistent wherever you went in the purpose of the Peloponnese. So, I've walked from one end to the other. I would highly recommend coming here. Um, I really would. I, you know, I would tell you if somewhere wasn't worth the effort. It's a little bit difficult to find this place. There's a great museum, so I'm left at the museum after you get to the actual town on the hill. Um, and there's a car park. But this place is just, it's blown my mind. The preservation, the architecture, the buildings, the history here is just fabulous. So if you get a chance, if you're in Calamata area, please come to Ancient Messini. Um, thank you for your subscription and please watch some of my other videos. I have a lot in Greece, all around the Peloponnese, and I hope you enjoy what I'm doing. So thank you.